Hello and welcome to another episode of It's About Time, collaborating with HBCU Today. And I'm your host, Caleb Carter. And let me tell you right now, before we get started, what I need you to do, if you haven't already, subscribe to KPVU TV on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, any social media that you have. If you want to, leave comments because today is going to be a special episode. And I, and I know, you're saying, Caleb, you say that for every episode. But look, let me tell you right now. This one is going to hit a little bit different because it's not every day that we have a living legend. It's not every day that we have an icon. It's not every day that we have the president of Prairie View a University, Dr. Ruth J. Simmons. So after this commercial break, we will have the chance to sit down and talk with the one, the only, Dr. Ruth J. Simmons. Hello and welcome to another episode of It's About Time, collaborating with HBCU Today. And as you can see, today is a special episode because we have the one, the only, Dr. Ruth J. Simmons. Thank you for joining us today. Let's, let's give her a hand clap, yes? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, now, Dr. Simmons, as we get started, uh, it's been a, a usual segment on this show that I want to give, I like to give people their flowers because Oftentimes, you know, the old saying is they don't get their flowers before they can smell them. So I want to take this time to give you your flowers. But I feel like I wouldn't be able to do you the, the, the good justice of it. So what I did was, along with my team, was go out and film people and get their perspectives on your presidency and what you mean to this campus. So we're going to take this time and, and toss it to that video right now. Okay. Thank you. Good God.
Um, but, uh, thank you. Of course, thank you. yes, ma'am. Thank you. Now, that that was just a, a, a few of the people because we know if I went around campus, that video may have been two hours long, <laughs> but I, I couldn't get just everybody. But one thing that I did want to say personally, Dr. Simmons, is that, and this is a kind of an indirect effect that you have, is that you have empowered the faculty. And we, we spoke a little bit about this earlier, is that especially here in the comm department, I can thank so many professors, uh, Professor Luster Blackwell, Professor Clomax, and Professor Dow Vest in particular. They have all sold into me things that I really can't make up for. It, it, there's no way that I can make that up to them. And that comes back to you because it starts with the head, right? There needs to be someone who sets the tone for that philanthropy, sets the tone for that heart for the children, sets the tone for that heart for education, and that starts with you. So I really just say thank you for all that you've done, all that you mean to Prairie View. I mean, it's an understatement to say that we're going to miss you, but um, thank you again for all that you've done. Thank and you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Now, before I want to get into this to this next segment. But um, before we get into that, we talked a little bit about how you serve with the president. And I want you to kind of detail that for our audience here today. So you had asked me uh, what my relationship was to the White House. Yes. And um, sometime now, every president in recent history has had a committee um, uh, on HBCUs. Uh, and so uh, people are appointed to that committee uh, to serve in the interests of HBCUs. And what it does is recommend directly to the President of the United States what needs to be done mm -hmm. in order to fortify and advance uh, HBCUs. Right. Every year, um, every department of the government in Washington is required to submit a plan for how they will include HBCUs in their work okay. and in particular in funding mm -hmm. and so we sit as a body to review the plan every year and to comment on whether or not it's appropriate okay. uh, whether it's enough mm -hmm. um, and then to uh, have the president approve it and as a consequence of that um, uh, HBCUs are able to get all manner of support for mm -hmm. physical facilities for grants and contracts um, for um, in technical support of the whole gamut. So uh, so it's a very important group, and I'm really uh, honored to be able to serve Prairie View and HBCUs on that committee. Right, and, and, I, and I have to thank you again because this past week I was able to travel to uh, Washington, yeah. D.C. <laughs> and represent Prairie View in, um, for the student journalists in an in a HBCU briefing with uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms and Vice President Kamala Harris. And I want to show that this to the audience, uh, a quick snippet of, of what that looked like. Okay. This is Caleb Carter from KPVU TV. And as you can see, we're here at the White House. And let me tell you, today was an amazing experience. It was a momentous occasion for over 30 HBCU student journalists who were selected to come to the nation's capital and participate in a White House briefing this past weekend. Students were able to meet a number of dignitaries such as Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms and Vice President Kamala Harris. A conversation that allowed for students to ask a variety of questions, from HBCU funding to climate change. But before the journalists went back to their respective schools, Vice President Harris left them with one message. And so use your voices. Continue to use your voices. Because we need you. And we need you to also talk about things like climate, right? starting a small business. A message that left the students feeling inspired and grateful. Being here today was just so surreal. Being in the atmosphere of the White House with other HBCU students and colleges representing, um, I'm more than grateful for this opportunity. An experience like none other, giving HBCUs that much needed exposure that they so greatly deserve. 
From KPVU TV, this is Caleb Carter. So I have to say thank you again for that for that opportunity. And hopefully I represented Prairie View well, because one thing that I learned going down there is that Prairie View has a name, right? It, I yes. mean, we're, we're not just some run of the mill university. Prairie View has a name and it holds weight. And, and that is greatly in part because of what you have done here. So again, I have to say thank you for that. I'm glad you were able to enjoy that experience. And I know that um, it will mean a lot to you, not just now, mm -hmm. but uh, well into the future during your career to have had that experience. And that's what I want for all of our students, to have the ability to go out into the world and to have the kinds of experiences that will expand their world right. and make them much more, um, uh, much more able to enjoy the benefits of their education. Right. And, and I kind of want to touch on that because I would like to know where does that heart for, for the children and heart for education comes from? Because although we, we tend to think that philanthropy is normal, it's, it's really not common. You know, we, we see people who, who don't contribute back and give back to others. But I would like to know where did that come from and, and how did that develop in your early years? Well, I, I, I think um, parenting is a big part of it. Uh, my mother in particular uh, thought it very important to teach us as children mm -hmm. Um, not to uh, be so self-involved that we miss the opportunity to uh, look out for other people. Right. Um, she was a very kind person herself. She denied herself things in order to help others. And that was the model that we had. But more than that, I have to say that, you know, my family was very, very poor mm -hmm. uh, and um, didn't have the means to do most things. Right. I remember when when we went to school and we had to have something, um, some equipment or um, uh, or any item, um, trying to figure out in my family how to come up with that was a major undertaking. Okay. And often we couldn't. And so as you might imagine, for any child um, uh, like that, when teachers step in and help you, mm -hmm. uh, because for no reason other than they want want you to succeed right that leaves a lasting impression on you mm -hmm. and so all the way through school from elementary school through junior high through high school really um teachers plural right uh reached out to me i had a, a middle school teacher who hired me to clean her house when i was in middle school okay. and that was that was a ruse because, of course, I, I wasn't doing any cleaning. All right. uh, but uh, just as a way of helping me um, earn some money. When I was in high school, teachers um, constantly looked out for me. And the thing that I remember most and that I cite sometimes is when I got ready to go to college, I'd gotten a scholarship, mm -hmm. but my family couldn't give me any help with anything else. Okay. And so... Um, uh, one of the teachers asked me to come over to her house to help with cleaning. And I went over there and it wasn't really that I was to clean at all. She asked me to go into her closet mm -hmm. and take clothes from her closet so that I would have some clothes to take to college. Wow. How could you do anything but look out for other people if people have been that kind to you? Right. And so I always, I always remember that. And I feel so... Um, I'm not sitting here today because of any remarkable thing I've done. I'm sitting here today because people created a path for me right. out of pure generosity. Right. And I never want to be the kind of person who would forget that. Right. And, and we definitely thank you for that. And, and it's very much evident in the way that you carry yourself. But Dr. Simmons, I want to I want to go to this because oftentimes when we look at people in positions of power, we tend to just focus on their position. But there was a Ruth Simmons before there was a doctor or President Simmons. So talk a little bit about, you know, your college years and and some of those that those times that helped you maybe say, OK, maybe I can take on some presidential roles, some some uh, professor roles and things like that. Well, I have to I have to confess that uh, when I was uh, in high school and in college, okay. I was pretty much insufferable. Hmm. <laughs> okay. 
uh, very opinionated, uh, very uh, garrulous. Um, I've always had a mouth since I was six years old, mm -hmm. and I used it. Uh, prolifically right. um, to tell people what they should be doing <laughs> uh, to express my opinion and so right. forth. So when I was in college, I was a nuisance okay. uh, to the administration uh, at, at my college because um, I was constantly judging everything. This is not good enough. You're not doing all that you should be doing. Right. Um, uh, we should be uh, able to um, to do a myriad other things and mm -hmm. so forth. And so I was I was I was a kind of lone activist when I was in college. Um, and I remember one day the president of the university called me to his house on a Saturday morning, and I thought, okay, I was getting kicked out of school. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, instead, he called me to say that they were going to send me away. Uh, for my junior year, okay. and I thought they must be so happy to get rid of me <laughs> for a year, uh, and so they sent me to Wellesley College mm -hmm. for my junior for my junior year, and um, and I in my senior year, um, the college uh, wrote to my family and explained that I would not be graduating. Wow, um, and I wouldn't be graduating because I had failed to follow the rules. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and therefore I wouldn't, I wouldn't be graduating. Mm -hmm. So I had a stroke of luck because I also, as a senior applied for everything, which I always encourage students to do right. apply mm -hmm. for everything. You know, you may get it, you may not get it. But I applied for everything and I got everything. Okay. And so I got a Fulbright, uh, fellowship. Um, I got admission to Harvard. I mm -hmm. got a Danforth fellowship. And so the university had, the college had a dilemma. How were they going to announce this if they didn't allow me to graduate? So mm -hmm. I actually graduated because of the external things that I got, right. because otherwise they were going to hold mm -hmm. me there and not allow me to graduate for minor, what I considered a minor offense. Um, and so, and that is being outspoken. And that's why I defend my students when they say things or do things that some grown up thinks is not appropriate, right. okay? Because what you're doing is readying yourself to stand up mm -hmm. for the things that you believe in. Right. And I was doing that when I was a teenager. Uh, I wasn't very successful at it because people didn't like it very much and I sometimes got punished for it. But on the other hand, that's what allowed me to survive mm -hmm. and to achieve what I've achieved because I have always been able to express my deep sense of commitment, mm -hmm. uh, my opinion, um, and I've just never held back right. on that. And, and we're, again, grateful for you being that way because more than anything, what we have learned in society and just in life is that you have to stand on your morals. You have to stand up for yourself when things aren't going the way that they're supposed to. And I'm going to just let, let the audience sit with that for, for, for a quick minute and they can read between the lines on that. But we got to go to a quick commercial, Dr. Simmons, okay. and we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more about your background and okay. your time here at Prairie View. Okay. Hello and welcome back to It's About Time, collaborating with HBCU today. Once again, I'm your host, Caleb Carter, and joining me, we have the one and only Dr. Ruth J. Simmons. Thank you again for joining us. 
but Dr. Simmons, we talked we talked a lot a bit about the past just just now before the commercial break. But I want to look toward the future, right? Because we know you have roles coming up in different capacities. One at Harvard, I believe you're the presidential advisor for the HBCU initiatives. And and at um at Rice, you are now the presidential fellow. So talk a little bit about those roles and what they entail. Well, um, first uh, I'll say that um, I've been associated for much of my career with HBCUs. Okay. I've, I've worked in different kinds of institutions, right. but I've always carved out a place for advocating for HBCUs. And so people know that about me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as a consequence, Harvard came to me uh, last year and asked if I would actually uh, take an appointment at Harvard. Okay. Um, I thought about that, and um, uh, after I decided I was going to step down here, uh, I had to confess that I was not really ready to move to Massachusetts. Okay. You know, I moved back home after I retired, and that was a very satisfying decision for me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I said, I can't, I can't do that. I can't move to Massachusetts. So what they said was, um, okay, you can do it from Houston. Right. We'll find a way for it to work for you, your being in Houston. Okay. At the same time, the president of Rice was aware that Harvard was making me this offer and thought that it would be appropriate for them to offer me a place to work. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they created this position for me wow. so that I would have a place to do my work. As I say, most people know what I care about. They know what I work on and right. so forth. And uh, I was once on the board of trustees at Rice. Okay. And so they know me very well at Rice and wanted very much for me to have the ability to continue to the work that I do because they know how much it means to me. So I'll be a, a presidential fellow okay. uh, at Rice. I'll have an office there uh, and support there. Okay. Um, and I will also be advising Harvard on this new program for HBCUs. Okay. And that's going to be a commitment that Harvard has made to help HBCUs. Because what I argued uh, to Harvard is that Harvard, you know, is over 300 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, they started with uh, a great deal of wealth to begin with. Right. But that wealth has compounded over centuries. Right. HBCUs have been starved right. for the duration of their existence and that that starvation um, and inequity has compounded mm -hmm. over time. And so my view is, which I express to the elite universities in the country, is you have an obligation to HBCUs right. because you've benefited from all of the wealth that's been given to you and all the support that you've been given. Uh, and HBCUs have not had that privilege because you've not brought them into the circle of, um, uh, of uh, advantage that you enjoy. And so I have two projects. One is working with the AAU, the top universities in the country, mm -hmm. to um, form partnerships with HBCUs. And that is now set up. We have a, uh, a, a, an office in Washington. Okay. And so all of these universities from Berkeley across the country to the East Coast uh, understand that we are expecting them to have partnerships with HBCUs. I'm unrelenting, right. I have to say. <laughs> right. Okay, they, they're, they're used to that with me. Um, so that will be the Harvard. Uh, we haven't set it up yet because I didn't want to set up precisely what we would be doing because so often elite institutions want to tell you what to do. Right. And that's not what I want. Mm -hmm. And so I told them, no, you cannot define it. Um, the HBCUs have to define it. So we'll bring uh, leaders from HBCUs to Cambridge in the fall, okay. and we'll start that work of designing what it is um, they would like for Harvard and institutions like Harvard to be able to do to assist HBCUs. Wow. I mean, f first of all, congratulations on your new role. It's very well deserved. And for our audience here today, let's, let's give her a hand. Thank you. I mean, because that type of advoc advocacy for HBCUs it's all it's very few and far in between. And for someone of, of your 
position and caliber to do such a thing. I mean, it it really goes beyond words how how grateful everyone should be towards you and that effort. But we let's talk about HBCUs in particular because we 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 know that they're underserved. We we know that they've been underserved, like you said, since since their installment. But I believe that ever since the uh, the tragic murder of George Floyd, there has been a, a, a slight shift in the, in the paradigm. Yes. And I believe that the HBCUs are kind of on the uptick. So I kind of want to yeah, hear your absolutely. opinion on that. Um, well, there's no question that this is the best uh, period mm -hmm. of time, uh, uh, certainly in my life, that I uh, for HBCUs. Um, uh, but one must be careful. Um, HBCUs have earned the right to be in control of their destiny. Okay. Um, not to have a short period during which they get handouts. Mm. Okay. That's not what this should. So our responsibility in HBCUs is to make sure that finally we get this right. Right. In terms of the capacity of these institutions with special missions to preserve their mission to enhance their mission and to define what education should be in HBCUs. Right. Uh, there are those who would like to take that away. And um, I think it's very important for us to be alert to that mm -hmm. and to be insistent that we won't tolerate it. So, so a lot of what we saw after George Floyd were placebos mm -hmm. um, to make us happy for time. Okay. Uh, but we have to be about more than being happy for a time. Right. We have to be about building because there's so many who will come after you mm -hmm. who need it. I feel blessed because I went to an HBCU and because I went to an HBCU, I had the strength to do what I had to do because I could not have done as well if I had been in a different kind of institution at that time. And I've always wanted to make it stronger, All right. make it better uh, for every generation that comes along and we've got to be vigilant that that's exactly what we do in this moment although the window is open right. there's no question about that and many many millions are being poured into hbcus right now very many. true very true <laughs> very true and and as an attendee of an hbcu and and my parents are alumna of hbcu i i just have a, a question because Whenever I think about the ways to solve some of the many problems that HBCUs face, it's often difficult to find that solution. And, and I know it's not often, and I know it can be found in just one thing. But in your opinion, what are some of the processes that can be put in place in order to, to help uh, counter, counter affect some of those plagues that, that HBCUs typically face? Well, I mean, first of all, let's, let's look at the play. Okay. Uh, I'm the first to say that the people who are hardest on HBCUs are um, African Americans. Mm. Um, uh, every slight problem is magnified um, uh, when it comes to HBCUs. And now I've been around. I've worked ten years at um, at Princeton, and then I went on to Smith, and then uh, the Ivy League, and and so forth. Um, these are problems that you see at every university. Right. Dissatisfaction with the pace. Dissatisfaction because you didn't get what you wanted. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we are elevating that to a level that I think is perilous for us because it gives us a reputation that people uh, causes uh, people to dismiss uh, HBCUs right. as places of incompetence. So the first of all, we have to be responsible. Mm -hmm and judge what is important uh, to cite and what isn't important. So, so that's number one. For, in terms of resources, I often say that we have to be first in line to support HBCUs, okay? We have to be the first to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I remember when I first started, um, I was speaking to a group and I noticed that there was a, an S550 parked outside. Do um, you know what that is? I don't. That's I just... the top of the line Mercedes been Benz automobile. Yeah, see, that's above my pay grade. Okay, well, but I can tell you it's, okay. it's very expensive. Right. And so I'm talking to this group, and I'm saying this is an example, that if you are going to drive an S550, mm -hmm. you should be giving at least that much 
to your HBCU. Mm. Okay. So that means, and then I give lots of other simple examples. Okay. Instead of going out to dinner twice a month, um, uh, instead of going out to dinner twice a month, take what you would have given for that those two meals and give it to an HBCU. Right. So we have to learn to sacrifice in order to build what we want. And that means um, that means don't wait for other people to support HBCUs. We right. should be first in line to support HBCUs. Um, next, I think um, uh, a university is all about faculty, okay? Um, if you don't have the right faculty, you cannot have a good university. And so we have to focus on the faculty and the support they need to thrive. Mm. And we also have to support them when we don't like what they're saying and what they're doing. Right. Okay. And that's another thing with HBCUs. So many HBCUs have have really t um, st uh, struggled with faculty freedom. Um, they want uh, faculty to behave um, as they wish. Administrations do. Right. But um, uh, any good college president will tell you that what you want as a college president is to have outspoken faculty who believe strongly in what they're doing, uh, who defend their students, mm -hmm. who set high priorities, who demand a lot. Right. I used to say um, as president, I don't mind a faculty member coming in and saying, I demand more. Okay. Okay. Because that's a sign that you have someone who ha has ambition and wants to take the institution somewhere. Mm. So, so I like faculty who are strong. Um, and then finally, uh, what will make a good university is our students have to have a breadth of experience, mm. just a, an enormous breadth of experience. My story is really all about that. It's about the fact that I not only went to college, but I had opportunities to do some of the most phenomenal things like you when I was a college student. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, uh, I was able to study abroad. I was able to go to other universities um, okay. uh, and learn at, in a different environment. I was able to travel and see things. And all of that had an enormous impact on my ability to make my way in the world. Right. So I always emphasize that students come to college, but that isn't all that they should be doing when they're in college. They right. should be experiencing a range of things. Uh, and that's why I want these partnerships to matter, because I want you to go to Harvard and spend time at Harvard um, and come back just I, as I did mm -hmm. uh, when I was uh, a, uh, an undergraduate student. Right. And and once again, I, I, I know I keep saying thank you, but thank you again for all that you do. I mean, because I don't know if if y'all if you guys have been listening, but this is some valuable, valuable information that that is almost in indispensable it, it you can't get this everywhere and and that is why i believe uh i think it was pre, pre, uh excuse me president mccola abdullah from virginia state university said that you were his role model i mean because and we see it right here but we're going to take a quick commercial break we're going to step aside for a few minutes and then we're going to come back and wrap up with the one the only president ruth simmons thank you This is Caleb Carter from KPVU TV. And as you can see, we're here at the White House. And let me tell you, today was an amazing experience. It was a momentous occasion for over 30 HBCU student journalists who were selected to come to the nation's capital and participate in a White House briefing this past weekend. Students were able to meet a number of dignitaries, such as Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms and Vice President Kamala Harris. Hi, everyone. Oh, I'm so happy to see you. Have a seat. We're going to have a conversation, Mayor. A conversation that allowed for students to ask a variety of questions, from HBCU funding to climate change. 
But before the journalists went back to their respective schools, Vice President Harris left them with one message. And so use your voices. Continue to use your voices because we need you. And we need you to also talk about things like climate, right? Starting a small business. A message that left the students feeling inspired and grateful. Being here today was just so surreal. Being in the atmosphere of the White House with other HBCU students and colleges representing. Um, I'm more than grateful for this opportunity. An experience like none other. Giving HBCUs that much needed exposure that they so greatly deserve. From KPVU TV, this is Caleb Carter. Hello and welcome back to It's About Time, collaborating with HBCU Today. And as you can see, still joining us, we have President Ruth J. Simmons. Thank you again for joining us. But President Simmons, before we before we get out of here, I want to talk a little bit more about your position at Rice and, and some of the uh, some of the things that consist of being the presidential fellow there. Well, uh, Rice has asked me to do things that relate to particular um, areas that I've worked in before. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are a number of different things. Um, first, they are trying to build a strong African-American studies program at Rice. Okay. And I built the program at Princeton, and then I led the redevelopment um, of the uh, African-American studies program at Harvard. Um, and people, I'm, I'm greatly identified with that work, and so they want me to help with that. In addition, um, Rice is going through a reckoning mm. with their history. Uh, they were founded by uh, a man who uh, wrote in his will that uh, no African Americans were to go to Rice. So they had to break the will in order to be able to admit black students. And so there's a his statue on campus is very controversial for African Americans, especially who view him as as a racist. Mm. And uh, they've been going through that process. I led a process like that at Brown University with regard to slavery. And so, um, actually, I spend a lot of my time advising universities going through that process. I recently advised Harvard going through their slavery uh, reckoning. Uh, and they came to me at Rice and asked me to help with that. And I've been helping them with their design of what they're going to do um, at Rice. And then the final piece is I, I mentor a lot of presidents. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I knew the current president uh, before he became president. Mm -hmm. I, I knew him as a dean of engineering. Um, and uh, I brought him to Prairie View mm -hmm. uh, to serve uh, as an advisor to me at Prairie View. And now he wants me to serve as an advisor to him. Okay. So the other part right. of my task will be to advise him mm -hmm. um, and so on. So uh, one of the things you always want to do in your career is develop um, friendships um, and uh, collaborations that will take you through your career, because one of the most satisfying things is to have people um, that you can talk to um, and who can help you uh, when you're in a quandary or mm -hmm. even when you're not in a quandary. Right. Uh, and so forth. So, so he and I go to lunch uh, and talk about uh, higher education. He's Haitian American. Okay. Uh, and he has a very particular story. The new president of um, Harvard is a Haitian American, so I'm going to be trying to get the two of them together mm. uh, so that they can uh, share 
some ideas um, uh, about how they lead uh, as Haitian Americans. And so, um, so I'll, I'll have I'll have quite a bit to do there, but mostly um, mostly to help them with what they believe are the most important things that they have to do. Right. And, and once again, congratulations on that new role. Well deserved. And it's, a, and it's beautiful that it's a full circle moment yes. that, uh, that you served him and, and now he is serving you. Well, flip that around, excuse me. But um, and I know my producer is going to hate me when I when I do this, but I, I do want to I, I just feel like this needs to be said, because just just in case anyone has questions about what Dr. Simmons has done, at Prairie View Annam University, even though they shouldn't have those questions. But it, in case they do, I, I feel like this needs to be read. You were the president during the pandemic, during Hurricane Harvey in Houston, during the, uh, the political uprisings as a result of George Floyd. We had a freeze in Texas. We, we all went through that where, where everything was shut down. You've launched the Ruth J. Simmons Center for Race and Justice here. We are now a Carnegie Research Two School because under your leadership, we and you have grown PVAMU's financial endowment by forty percent, and the list goes on. That's just what I can squeeze into this little time frame. So let's give her a round Thank of applause. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we're, I'm told we have a question on the board, and it says, if there was one word. Uh, I, I need my. If there was one word that the president Ruth Simmons could say to encourage our students, faculty, and staff for the future, what would it be? Certainly, um, believe. You can't do much if you don't believe. Um, and so, believing in this place, believing in yourselves, believing in your capacity, no matter what you see, no matter what you hear that will keep you going and that will keep you rising if you do that. But you've got to have that strong sense of belief in what you can accomplish. Well, thank you for that, for, for, for those. Yeah, we can go ahead. We do need to make sure that we believe and we of course believe in you and all that, the good work that you're going to do at Rice and along with Harvard. And I have to say this, we we are all I believe we're all rooting in the best interest of PVMU and our new president, Dr. Tamikia Lagrange. But we still have to say thank you and give our gratitude for all that you have done for us. So I couldn't let that I couldn't let this show in today without saying that again. And thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> and this has been another episode of It's About Time, collaborated with HBCU today. That was President Dr. Ruth J. Simmons, and I'm your host, Caleb Carter. Thanks for watching.